She's optimistic, cheerful. Sanguine. Okay. The glass is half empty. Sees the negative. <laughs> Melancholy. Mm. Half full. No, wait. Half empty. No, half. What was the question? <laughs> so the question that matters. Yeah. And there's a caller. Hey, I ordered a cheeseburger. <laughs> Four basic personality types. Okay. Now let's go over this again briefly. The sanguine is very optimistic and sunny and cheerful and silly and even childish. The choleric is very optimistic, but very takes charge. Let's do the work. Let's have a big picture. And you know what? No nonsense. We got work to do. The melancholy is, I love you. I will go to the cross for you. But if you betray me, you're dead. <laughs> and the phlegmatic says, it's OK. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's just have peace. OK? So tell me who these are. What's this next one? My my <laughs> Melancholy. Oh, so nice right out of you. <laughs> Which one is this? Collar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Let's talk about masking. This is a really important part of temperament studies that a lot of people, a lot of teachers and authors do not cover. In fact, some of the older temperament books say that you can be a sanguine and a melancholy. And that's not true. Those are the opposites. But there are people, there are sanguines who look melancholy and act melancholy, and there are melancholies who look and act sanguine. That's because they are wearing a mask. So masking, wearing a mask and not really presenting your full, true self, is that good or bad? Oh. Oh. God, you guys are smart. <laughs> yeah. We can develop false personality traits because someone told us we needed to be different or they shamed us. So we put on the mask. Is that good or not good? It's not good. It's, it's out of fear and shame and criticism. We don't want to be rejected. We want to fit in with others. That's a basic human need. And we want to be loved and respected. So a lot of us learn to behave in ways that others expect that are not our natural strengths. Now, it's not natural for children to sit still and be quiet. Okay, that's their natural response. But we don't use that as an excuse. And we train them out of that to be able to sit still and master themselves, master their emotions. We don't shame the children for being fidgety, but we don't let them be that way until they're 25 or 30. We train them out of it, just to a higher level of behavior. So we have understanding, as Father was saying earlier, we have understanding about this person where they are, but we always call them to go higher. And we encourage them, and we pray for them, and we love them. And if there are kids, we spank them until they do what we do. <clears throat> when we mask to deceive, we betray others and ourselves. When we mask out of love, it can be a virtue. Can you think of any time when you might mask who you naturally are that would be a good and virtuous thing to do? Maybe if somebody asked you if they look fat in a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. If somebody asks you if they look fat in that skirt. You almost say yes. So you lie. <laughs> so you lie. Okay, little lies lead to big lies. And I love what you just said. Okay, that's a very beautiful color. <laughs> Deflection. Deflection. So no, we 
we don't want to hurt people. So here's what I learned to say instead is, do you feel fat in that place? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it looks good. I just wanted your opinion. It's been great. If you think it looks good, go for it. Hmm. And this is a funny thing. This is, this, this is what we do. We go through phases, I think, when we don't say anything. And then we go, no, I need to be honest. Yes, you do look fat. And it is all for years, right? So it's a tough thing. What's the, what's the greater good? To be truthful and honest or to preserve their sense of fantasy? <laughs> and the truth may be they don't look fat. They're just afraid they look fat. See, look at the complexity of just that one question that you brought up. Look at how complex we are as people. That's why we can't treat this real, real simply. It is very simple and it is very complex at the same time, both and. When I was a, a commercial real estate appraiser, I, one of the things that I learned from my dad was how to be an expert witness in court. And I, though I wanted to be that because I found out he made $1,000 a day. This was back in the day. So I said, Dad, you know, I want to be an expert witness. So he called one of his lawyer friends and he said, look, my daughter's a young appraiser. She's never testified in court. Will you teach her? And he said, okay, great. So he gave me a case. I did the real estate appraisal. I was getting ready to testify on the stand. And I'll never remember. He's a, 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 I'll never remember. I'll never forget. He had uh, argued before the Supreme Court. He was an excellent uh, mentor. And he taught me how to listen. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, Rose, the important thing is when you get on the witness stand, anybody here do court work ever? Okay, Father. So you're on the witness stand, and you're going to tell the jury and the judge what you believe about this property. You're the expert. Remember that you know more about that real estate than anybody. You're the pro. You got paid for this expert opinion. You tell them why it's worth what you think it's worth. You know more than the judge, more than the jury, more than the other lawyer. Go, okay, okay, he goes, but the other lawyer is getting paid $400 an hour to make you look bad. And, well, and then since, since I have your ear, and one of the things that he did, he says, we're gonna get, they're gonna have a big graphic up there about the real estate and the lawyer's gonna ask you to come up there and stand in front and point to the top and then he's gonna make you point to the bottom and make it go down, down, down until your butt's like right in the people's face and try to humiliate you. I go, okay, I'm not gonna do that. If I, if I do, I'll go to the side and do this. <laughs> so he was telling me all the tricks that the other side used to, make, to humiliate you and discredit you. One of the things that they do is they trick you with their questions. They say, you have to be a good listener. Don't be so fast, because you know I'm a double extrovert, right? I'm proud of it, you know? <laughs> so don't be so fast. Stop and listen to the question. It's like the melancholy phlegmatics. And I go, okay, okay. <clears throat> so then he goes, well, now first tell me, how many animals did Moses take on the ark? I said, two. Are you sure? Two of each kind. And off I went, right? I wasn't listening. I was so quick to answer. How many animals did Moses take on the ark? None. It wasn't Moses. <laughs> Right? Look yes. how quick we all are, even the introverts, quick, 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 to get the answer. So I learned how to listen. And the other thing that he said to me, he said, I know you're smart, and you did an excellent job in this appraisal, and you're a good communicator, but the way you look. And I go, what's wrong with the way I look? Well, I have the big hair, and I have the makeup, and I have the big earrings, and cute loud colors on my jacket, and he goes, the minute you walk out, people are going to judge you by what you look like and think that you don't know anything, that you're like, you know, this fun little airhead. I go, okay, I got that. You know, I'm not stupid. And he goes, in the courtroom, you put all that aside so that they can understand. You're helping the jury. You're opening their mind and heart for the truth that you're about to deliver. There's no distraction there. So pull your hair back. 
wear little tiny pearl earrings, and wear a navy blue suit with a white blouse. Navy blue, that color connotes authority and trust, like policemen. Those are back in the days when we loved policemen and trusted them. Right? So I did. I toned it down. I had a flat navy blue blouse with a nice, nice, I felt like I had my Catholic school uniform on. A white, toned down, but I was still myself. But I put on a melancholy mask. I put on a mask and hid who I naturally was for the benefit of the jury. Not to deceive so much as to get the distraction out of the way to open their mind and heart to what I wanted to, to deliver to them. So I, I, I learned the difference. There are nuances in our behavior, and that's why our wonderful Catholic answer is usually you know yes and no and both and. When we mask to deceive somebody or manipulate somebody, that's sinful, and it's usually based on fear. When we mask out of courtesy and we hold back out of self-mastery, that's a virtue, and that is very good. So here we are. Here's our raw material. This chunk of marble is like our raw temperament when we're born. Nothing has really shaped us yet. So do you know the story about Michelangelo and the marble in the quarry? <coughs> Michelangelo was looking for a beautiful piece of marble, and he had a new statue in mind, went through the quarry and found this perfect, perfect, big, giant chunk of marble and said, I'll take that one. And uh, the quarry owner said, well, why do you want that one? And he says, because there's an angel in there and I must set her free. Oh, wow. So what can shape our raw material from just that to the finished product? And those of you who have asked me, can we change? Does our temperament change? And I say, no, 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 it doesn't change. It has changed, but it has not changed. It has changed, but it has not changed. The basic elements of the marble are always there. But the chipping away and the loving hand of the artist has made a beautiful masterpiece. So temperaments are raw. Who we are as finished pieces of art in God's handiwork uh, is what really matters. So what can shape us? What does shape us as we move through life? Experience. Experience. Let's take a look at it. Since we just ate, here we go. <laughs> this is a multi-layered sandwich. There are many, many layers to it. A piece of meat, a piece of bread, and a slice of bacon don't make a sandwich. Those are the raw materials, but put all together, then we have that sandwich. So we're like that. Our parents and our family can shape us. If they delight in our temperament, it has room to flourish. If they shame us for our temperament, we will tend to mask. Our siblings and our peers who again, delight in us, understand us, or try to make us like them. Or we try to be like our peers. We don't feel accepted or we're afraid, so we try to dress or act like other people. Our teachers can shape us. Our birth order can shape us. How many have studied birth order and its effect on human behavior? Anything you want to share about that or do you remember? What do you think birth order does to people growing up? Labeling. I'm the middle child. What is that really? What am I saying? Ignored child. Oh, I've been ignored and nobody values me like I should be valued. Between the older and the younger, you have to I'm sorry? You have to become the peacekeeper of the three. Otherwise, they're going to come at one another. Okay, so some people don't want to be the peacekeeper. So hopefully, in a big Catholic family, you have somebody who will take on that role. <laughs> exactly. So what about the oldest child? Bossy. Bossy? Bossy? Yeah. I'm sorry, say again? Nine out of ten astronauts are the firstborn children of their family. Nine out of 
10 astronauts are the first born in their family. That's very interesting. And more US presidents are first children. Okay, so what happens to a first child? They're leaders. They are trained to be leaders. They are trained to take care of younger children. They are trained to help mother and father in their responsibilities. Can you have a phlegmatic firstborn? A low key, easy, low energy firstborn? Absolutely you can. And God bless that, that phlegmatic introvert is getting extra training to come out of their shell and to help and to be a little more vocal or to be a leader. They're learning leadership skills that don't come as naturally. The firstborn who's, a, who's an extrovert, they fit like a hand in glove right into that role. So birth order doesn't change you or determine you, but it can help shape you. So, I'm sorry? First boy and a first girl. Well, again, not to bring the, the gender, this, I, I'm not going to say gender because that's actually a, 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 a ver, vocabulary word. Mm -hmm. The sex of the boy or girl, in a certain sense, doesn't matter. It's how they're treated in the family. Is that first, if the first one is a boy and then the first girl, is she given leadership roles and all that other stuff? Then she's being treated like a firstborn. Right. The middle child can be any temperament. And by just by nature, they get ignored sometimes because of all the chaos going on. What a, I have a choleric brother who was a middle <coughs> child, and he was always throwing tantrums. And nobody understood that. I mean, big, major, fuming tantrums. His skin around his nose had turned white. He was screaming so loud. He was choleric. And he wasn't in a position of power or authority or leadership, and nobody listened to him. And he was shuffled around. He had a miserable childhood. Mom and dad, if I could go back, I'd say, Mom, give John something to be in charge of. He needs to be in charge of something. Right? But we know when we have all those kids, we can't, you can't be the perfect parent. Even if you have one kid, you can't be the perfect parent. So middle children do get shaped for the good or not good by being lost in the crowd sometimes. But it doesn't, det doesn't determine the rest of your life. But it can shape you. Notice I said can shape you. What about the baby? They're the favorite. Okay. <laughs> Why are babies the favorite? Why are they Why are they spoiled? Okay, great. The parents have a special attachment to the last child. The parents have grown and matured. They've relaxed. Things are different. I know in our family of nine kids, we always say that the first four of us got a whole different mom and dad than the last five. Really? So, yes. I'm sorry. I always tell my oldest one, he, one day he calls and said, Mom, you never let me. And I said, I know. And I want to thank you very much. You were the greatest teacher, my greatest teacher I've ever had. You taught me to be a, a better mother, a better understanding mother, and more patient and uh, wore me out. So now they can do what they want. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. But they do. They taught my children. Each one of them taught me a little bit more on how to be a wise woman. Okay, good. So you paid attention to what your children were saying. And another beautiful thing that you brought up is it's never too late. Maybe some of you in this room are realizing you failed to give one of your children or more something that they really needed. Now it's an opportunity to say, I learned something that I never knew. And I was reflecting back at this time, and please forgive me, but I'm so proud of you, and I love you very much, or whatever. I'm not trying to manipulate you or control you. <laughs> but the, these, are, these are beautiful things. So I don't want to spend too much time on birth order, but it is real. It's a thing. It can shape us, but it doesn't change us, and it doesn't determine us. It's just another influence on life, in the, in the sandwich of life. Workplace roles. Many introverts are in, place, are in positions of leadership and authority and being the boss, and they do beautifully. But that doesn't...
doesn't mean they're an extrovert. Ancestry and custom. Ancestry and custom. In some cultures, the men are always expected to be this way. The women are always expected to be that way, right? Tell me about this Cajun culture thing. I don't know anything about that, except the food. What goes on in the Cajun? What goes on in the roles in families and marriages in Cajun culture? from Nova Scotia and we were Catholic yeah. and we didn't have the Protestant work ethic instilled in because we weren't Protestant and so it's very family and community focused because it's not about work 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 make more money make more money make more money work enough Wow because it's family Wow so that is beautiful beautiful so balance is. I love that the Cajun is, since they didn't have, in a global sense, the Protestant work ethic, work, 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 achieve, which is the Western world, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was more about family. And you work hard, but you work enough, and that's it. And family comes first, right? And faith. That's, we and need faith. more of that. Faith. And faith. faith. Is very At least deep. historically it was. I mean, you know, the we Cajun culture isn't as pure as it used to be, so there, it has not you know, the world has infiltrated. Well, and that's why we need to be on guard and pass those values on. Go out and be fruitful and multiply and pass this Cajun thing on. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's really God's order. It's really beautiful. Okay, what else can affect us? Culture. You know, we were talking about sarcasm and snide remarks and criticism. What has been in our TV shows the last few decades? I mean, even, even, to, even to the 60s. You know, snotty remarks, eye rolling, and, and, and then you hear the laugh track. Ha ha ha. And so we're all trained to like laugh at snide remarks. Snide remarks are painful. And what about the dumb idiot husband? That's, I hate that. Hate that, hate that, hate that. So be aware, these, these are the things that shape us. Social pressure can shape us. Illness can shape us. Do you think a sunny sanguine is a delight to be around when he or she is sick? No. When people don't feel good, no, no temperament is working in their strengths. They're drained, they're tired, they're sick. Drugs and alcohol. A lot of people, especially introverts, will rely on drug and alcohol to bring me out of my shell to give me courage, liquid courage, right? Well, maybe one martini, but you know, it's we don't wanna be dependent on that. We wanna learn how to love ourselves and be confident and, and be able to speak when we need to speak and be quiet when we need to be quiet. Education can really shape us, open our eyes. Age and maturity. And you were saying this earlier today, I have changed, I have changed. <laughs> now, I know you have because you've grown in wisdom and grace and maturity, but you haven't changed at the same time. Grace, 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 grace is what will get rid of our fears, work on an interior life, and make us flourish and blossom in our natural strengths. It doesn't matter what your combination is. You can be strong and beautiful and a gift to the world if you get that fear out of the way. So I don't know why I threw this layered cake in. It had layers and it looked real sanguine to me, so I just thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> doesn't mean anything. So let's look at some quick ways to tell. When you're walking into a room, like I do, and I'm, I'm just, hmm, Mm, phlegmatic, melancholy. You know, how do I do that? You, you, and again, caveat. Don't be so quick to do it when you don't know what you're doing because you could make a big mistake and you are putting you are putting labels on people and putting them in a box. That's why when I have been speaking with you, 
I think I know what you are, and I would probably bet money on it, but I have also qualified and said, I'm not sure, and especially with your husband, not until I meet him, because I did make mistakes before, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> loud talkers. Who are loud talkers? Well, they're cholerics who are in charge. They're also sanguines who are on stage, but they're also introverted melancholies who are on stage or holding court. Or old deaf people are loud talkers. <laughs> <laughs> the introverted melancholy, once the door is open and they feel comfortable, the quality of mercy is not strained. Right? They will be a loud talker because they are on stage and they're good at it. Fast movers. And we know that the, in, the extroverts have a higher energy level normally and they move more quickly, but who else moves fast? Cholerics, anytime. <laughs> Sanguines, going places. But phlegmatics can move really, really fast and work really hard and I call, they, they spin. They're very busy, they're very, very fast moving. I know a priest friend of mine who's so melancholy and so phlegmatic, but he's always walking really fast all the time. And he's gotta go here, gotta, I can barely keep up with him. And I was like, what is that? And I knew right away, he's phlegmatic, melancholy, he deeply cares about his people, he's in charge of about 6,000 families. Wow. What do you think about his calendar? Priests are underpaid and overworked. Let's say it again. Right, Father? Well, if I said yes, then that would sound so A blessing. <laughs> <laughs> so he is racing, racing around all day long because he has so much to do and his deep melancholy heart wants to take care of everybody and everything. And he drives himself ragged. He looks like a choleric. But you can see it in his face. He's exhausted all the time. So I take it upon myself every once in a while to call him up and go, Father, let's go. Let's go have fun. Forget all those people. I can't forget my people. Yes, you can. Let's go. And we do. And we go have a good time. That's what sanguines are good for. Now, if he really has something to do, I'm not going to sit there and push him because now my strength at getting him out to do something fun becomes a weakness. Come on, you're always working, you know? You can go over that edge. You gotta be careful with your gifts. Because if you go too far, you're not in your strengths, you're in your weaknesses. Non-stop talkers. Do you know anybody like this? You do not have to raise your hand. <laughs> Usually it's cholerics who are trying to convince somebody. They're really on fire, they really think it's important, and they're gonna keep talking and talking until you agree. Or sanguines who are seeking attention. And they're getting it, but they want more and more and more. Or melancholies who want you to know every little detail because it's important and they will tell you even though you don't want to know because you should know. <laughs> That's my husband. So I'm the big picture. Honey, just give me the bottom line, okay? Well, and away we go. And it's like forever. And I would get impatient and, you know, not good. And I know my body language is going to send a message to him that I don't even care what he's saying. But you know what? He's not even paying attention to my body language. He's in a story. He loves his story. He, in his mind, he's going over every little detail and how it felt. And he's like, and I'm like, oh, I'm here trying to be virtuous and he doesn't even see me. <laughs> So what I've learned to do is take notes. And I asked him, I said, honey, sometimes you go off in the weeds. He goes, what do you mean I go into the weeds? I go, well, you know, with all those beautiful, important details, and I do want to hear everything, and I sometimes can't keep up. Do you mind if I take notes? And he thought about it, he goes, no, that's a good idea. So I go, okay, so when we have important talks, and I know that I do need to have some kind of response or input in, I, ha I, I take notes and I wait patiently and I have learned not to open my mouth <laughs> or make any comment or say anything. And 
and allow him to speak uninterrupted. That is really hard to do for some of us. And it's a virtue, and I can only do it by grace. God's grace made me want to do that for him, and then God's grace empowered me to do that for him. So these are things, this is an important thing to help you in your marriage, in your parenting, in all your relationships. We can do this. Who they marry. How many remember, remember Ma and Pa Kettle? I loved them. Okay. Ma and Pa Kettle, take a look at the picture. <clears throat> Which one is the choleric? Ma. Which one was the phlegmatic? Pa. Remember Pa? Yes, Ma. He just went along. But he was, he was the man, and he saved the day a lot of times. So opposites do attract. Do they always attract? No. Do you know some people? Okay. Remember, we talked earlier, there are not really a lot of true cholerics and a lot of true sanguines. The extroverts are the smaller of the population, of the general population. We're not evenly matched. Okay. So let's go into this. We are created to be complementary, but man and woman are already complementary. A husband and wife, no matter their temperament, are already opposites who are attracted. And they're already created to be complementary to one another. Opposites attract, or do they? Man and women are already opposites. <clears throat> so yes, opposites do attract. Here's the reality. When there is no true caller in the relationship, the one with more melancholy will usually rise to the top and function as the choleric as needed. So you have two, you have two introverts, a husband and wife, and they're both introverts. Okay, they get along great. They don't make waves, they keep the peace, they're, they're both easy going, and they like that. Because you know what, there's no choleric and they're pushing them. They just work at their own speed. They're great together. But when there is maybe an overwhelming decision or something hard that may really needs to be done, the one who has the intensity of the melancholy will go a little deeper, hang with a little tighter, and help push them into that whatever that decision is. Does that make sense? Do you recognize that in your own relationships? Yes. Do you have a question? Or no? okay. Why would a phlegmatic marry another phlegmatic? <coughs> Why would an introverted, low-key, easygoing, kind, gentle, supportive, soft, sweet, faithful phlegmatic marry another person who's a phlegmatic rather than a choleric? Peace. Yeah. Peace. 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 Comfortable. No conflict. It's exciting to be with an extrovert. It's exciting to be with an extrovert, but it's exhausting to be with an extrovert. And if they're not mature, they will run right over you and hurt you and wound you, and you will have a miserable relationship, be it a friendship, parent, child, or marriage. So again, we talked about layers. Maturity and grace is really important in all this. So here's a picture of me at Senior Ball, 1969. I'm the one in the middle, and there's my boyfriend. And I, God, I loved him. Mm -hmm. I'm still in love with him. But, and he was a, he was a, I said, we say, a tall drink of water. <laughs> he, had, he had a lanky stride. He was, a, he was deep melancholy. He played the guitar. He was romantic. He was poetic. He was really intelligent. But he was easy going, kind of walked like this. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> right? But he started pushing me sexually. 
And at first, and you know, that it's fun, but then I was I was trying to be a good little Catholic girl and I was scared and I wasn't ready. And I just kept saying no. And he got frustrated after about a year. I, I loved it because our you know, I was his girlfriend and even our parents met. And I remember I spent a Christmas at his house one time with his mom and dad. And anyway, um, one night I went to Baskin Robbins where he worked. And I saw him in the window and he had his little white cap with a little bow tie and he was scooping ice cream. And there was a tall, lanky, gorgeous blonde in there leaning across the counter and they were making goo eyes at each other. And I was like, oh, I, I, I'll never forget, you know, these, these experiences, they never leave you. I was so crushed, I cried all the way home. I learned after that, sadly, that if I wanted love, I had to give sex. And that's what I did, that's the path I went down and a lot of us women do when we were younger and older because we're so desperate and we don't know any other way. It was real painful for me. But 40 years later, at our high school reunion, I walked in and there he was. And I was shocked because I'd been through divorce, separation, healing. I had a wonderful life on my own. I have church ministry, I travel, I speak, do all these wonderful things. I have people I love and they love me. I don't need a romance. I don't need a husband. You, everybody would love to have a good husband, but you, we don't really need a good husband. That's true. Not to be happy, right? And I know there are a lot of women in this room who don't have a husband. Okay, so they're a blessing, but they're not a necessity in a certain sense. Don't go out and say, Rose Sweet said you don't need to be married. <laughs> not what I say. So, and I have, I have a sinful past behind me, and I, God, with God's grace, I cleaned it all up, and I was like, oh, God. Because when I went up to the bar, and there he was, I started having a physiological reaction. I went weak in the knees, and I was like, <laughs> after 40 years, I go, what is this? And I, I remember, I prayed, Lord, I never want to displease you. So I like got a glass of wine, and I walked away, right? Well, he started following me. Because he had the same feeling. So he followed me around the reunion and we were kind of flirting with each other and it turns out we both had been married and divorced and and I, I said, um, well, you know, what's going on? He goes, well, I'd like to take you out. Not kill you, but take you out on a date, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I go, okay. And I was like, I was so conflicted. I mean, part of me never wanted to, I didn't trust myself. But at the same time, God's grace is stronger than we are and I should have just been fine. So we went out on the date and on that first date, I broke all the rules. It's not what you think. <laughs> the rule book at that time was, this is the latest secular dating thing, never reveal too much on the first date. Get him to buy you dinner and another dinner and take you on it, you know, just play it cool and calm. And I go, I'm not doing that. I'm too old. And that's dishonest. I'm going to tell him exactly who I am and what I need. So on that first date, I go, I'm still Catholic. And I love our church more than ever. And I love our Lord Jesus Christ. He is my personal Savior. And I go to Mass and I follow all the rules. And I am never having sex outside marriage again. Because now I finally know why. Because I studied theology of the body. Do you know who Pope John Paul II is? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him a big theology of the body lecture on our first date. And he went, I just wanted to buy you a margarita. <laughs> <laughs> and then I leaned in and I said, because I'm this stuff emboldens you. This is the Holy Spirit. The truth sets you free and makes you courageous. And I said, aren't you tired of having women use you? I don't need to know the details to know that women use men. He was, yeah. And I go, and aren't you tired of using women? Again, I didn't know the details. I didn't have to. And he was taken aback. And I saw something change on his face. And he goes, what other way is there? And I said, I know the way. 
come, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> and I dragged his little butt to a Theology of the Body retreat for a week long, and we courted, and we got married. <laughs> <laughs> who I was as a person, and he pushed himself on me sexually. The reason I married him is he learned the beauty of the human body, God's plan and design to be male and female, as made in the image and likeness of God, and that the marital act is an expression of wedding vows. And for the first time in my life, we both saved ourselves for the wedding night. If this is possible, and I remember before that we set the wedding date, he says, well, this is really going to happen. He goes, I, and he, you know, he's been with a million women, right? He goes, I feel like a teenager. I, kind of, I don't know if I know what to do on the wedding night. And I said, oh, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a sweet and beautiful restoration of our virginal spirit. We weren't virginals in our bodies, but we were restored and redeemed in our minds and our hearts and our souls. And it was totally worth it. And this is why I love working with theology of the body and people who've been divorced and separated and they find new love and they can't keep their hands off each other. And I go, you can do this. You can do this. Or young people who come to me and they're engaged no, you can live as brother and sister. A lot of us in here already do, right? <laughs> right, there are times when you, you don't have intercourse, maybe for a long, long time. You still love each other and honor each other and live faithfully to each other. So these are, these are questions and conversations sometimes we don't bring up, we're afraid to. That's why I love TOB. It gives us the language and the reference point to talk about these things. In a, in a realistic way, in a beautiful way. So I married my complete opposite, and he knows it. He married me, <laughs> freely, fully, faithfully, and fruitfully. What about you? Who did you marry? Did you marry the op an opposite? Did you marry somebody that's the same? Maybe, maybe you guys share a square. Maybe you're both melancholy and one's choleric and phlegmatic. It doesn't really matter who you married as far as the temperaments. What really matters is do you know how to love? And that's why I love in this event here in Lake Arthur, Father has allowed us to marry TOB with the temperaments. That's what we've done this weekend. We've married theology of the body with the temperaments. And they beautifully are complementary to each other. It's all about knowing how to love the other person and how, and how loved we are by God. Let's talk about how they parent. Mm -hmm. Here are my three stepsons. Got these babies in the deal. <laughs> love all of them. Okay, Pat is choleric melancholy. He is large and in charge and very sensitive and loving and thoughtful and kind, very passionate. The baby, who's the tallest one, is mostly phlegmatic with some melancholy. He's just easygoing. Everybody loves Rory. Everybody loves, he's inoffensive. Inoffensive, adaptable, kind, sensitive. And there's the rebel, Matt, the melancholy. Angst, anxiety, dread, fear, passion, love, romance. Everything is drama with him. He's the fraternal twin of Pat the choleric. So every time getting ready for school, when the when, when the Pat got his driver's license, he'd come to me and say, 
my brothers won't get out of bed. They're disorganized, they're unorganized, they're late, and we're gonna be late. And I would go, just leave them. Drive off without them. And he'd go, yeah. <laughs> so the two callers, they're like this, right? So at the very last minute, did he take off without him? No. No, because his melancholy said, we can't do that to our brothers. <laughs> So there's a, there's a typical example of the, the balance and even the fight sometimes between your two natural temperaments. So how do they parent? How does a sanguine parent? The sanguine easily takes charge as an extrovert. Loves kids, but they expect love and affection. They will give love and expect affection, but they want it back. So this is typically me. When I, when I was young and babysitting, I'd be real affectionate to the little kids, right? Loving and they'd respond, but then I'd come up with a little melancholy child. It'd be like this. Who are you, who are you, why are you, you know, why are you here, where are you? And they'd be stiff. And I didn't know anything about temperaments. And I would, so here I am saying, right? Hmm. Loving, affectionate, and it's genuine. But when I see the resistance, my choleric would rise up and I'd go, you little rat. <laughs> and I would reject them. This makes almost makes me cry when I think about it. I didn't know how to love a little melancholy child who would like have their guard up. Don't come near me. I, I'm naturally suspicious and you're weird. I didn't I didn't know that. So I would reject them back. So this this is you know, this is important stuff, and if we can't get this right, we're gonna, we're gonna hurt the people that we love. Sanguines follow discipline with affection. They're really good. When they have to spank you or ground you or whatever they do to you, they will definitely follow it up with lots of love and hugs and kisses, which is good balance. They're a good teacher, and they're fun. They make things light and fun. They're quick to forgive and forget. Very quick to forgive and forget. But as we learned, that's not necessarily a good thing when, when somebody's hurting you or abusing you. But they can forget the kids, too. <laughs> Sanguines and phlegmatics, the two easygoing ones, we're easily distracted. We don't stay focused very long, unless we really, really want to and we're, you know, Something is really motivating us. They can deeply offend the little melancholy children and overwhelm the phlegmatics. I remember my sister brought one of my nieces to my house one time. She was very, my little niece, Sarah, was very, she's so adorable, so sweet, very melancholy though. Her brow was always furrowed and uh, she was a little whiny. So here's the labels. I used to call her whiny. I know. Come here, whiny. I said with a smile on my face, so I thought, you know, that countered it, right? Well, she's also phlegmatic, so she didn't make waves or take me on. She just absorbed it. So a couple years later, Saturday morning, knock on my door, I open it up, there's little Sarah, this big, and my sister, Barb, standing in the back of her. Aunt Rosie, Sarah has something she would like to say to you. And I love that my sister taught her little child to have a voice. So I said, yes. She goes, Aunt Rosie, I really don't like it when you call me whiny. <laughs> and I was like, you are whiny right now. I, I didn't say that, right? And I, but I was convicted and I went, oh. And I knew enough to bend down to her level. I go, honey, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. And I, again, I bit my tongue, I want to go, but you are whiny. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a self-mastery that Grace can give you. And I said, I'm sorry, honey, will you forgive me? I love you very much. And I go, come on in here. And so we went in the house, everything was fine. That's all she needed. But the sanguine wants to just make sure that everybody's happy, right? So I almost wanted to tease her and again go, I can call you whiny now, right? I know. I know. I know. I didn't. But I thought about it. <laughs> but I was learning the temperament.
temperaments and understanding self-mastery and the grace that we need for that is so important. We have to know what others need from us and, and be free to give it to them. How do the choleric parent? Well, they easily take charge, obviously. They expect obedience and loyalty. No nonsense, no negotiation, no time out, no excuses, just do it. Now, how does God parent his children? Oh, wow. Deep dive into scripture about God's parenting. That's another book I want to write. Both and. He gives you free choice of love. He gives you free. Sometimes he is mean and he will smite, he'll, he'll knock you dead if you disobey the, the commands. And he will send, you know, enemies to take you over and put you in bondage for 400 years. And other times he will be merciful and forgiving and heal you and love you. So depending on the, as Father was saying earlier, not just the unity of people, but the individual person. The individual situation. God deals with us based on who we are and the situation. Sometimes harsh, seemingly harsh, which is actually loving. You do not tolerate sin. God does not tolerate sin. He still loves us, and he doesn't tolerate sin. Cholerics don't tolerate. Their opposite phlegmatics will tolerate it so that they can keep the peace. Right. They're unafraid of discipline and sometimes go over too overboard. They're good teachers when they're not too busy running all the committees. <laughs> Call, you know, call yourself to be in charge of everything. They can bark and be insensitive, and they can run roughshod over the little phlegmatics, and they can wound the sensitive melancholies. Two of my boys, when they were little, at Lake Tahoe. Anybody been to Lake Tahoe in California? Isn't it beautiful? Here's what the sanguine mom made them do. <laughs> That's both boys. <laughs> you bury one in the sand and the other one puts his head down. Mm -hmm. So one was choleric, Mikey was choleric, and Joe was phlegmatic. And they, they, were, they loved each other dearly. And one day they got in big trouble from me because they did something willfully disobedient. And if I bet money on it, I know Mikey was the instigator. And Joe just went along. But Joe freely went along. So I said, you boys get in here. Everything's done for the day, and you're going to do chores all day long. And I said, Joe, a phlegmatic, I go, here's the Windex. You Windex every glass surface in this room, every table, every window. Get to work right now. Mikey, you get in there, and you clean the bathroom. I thought, oh, that's good, the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> a few minutes later, I went in the room, and your poor little phlegmatic was going, <laughs> he, it was a perfect punishment for him. He hated it. Mikey, the choleric, who loves work, was whistling the tune to the Pink Panther. <laughs> and he's in the bathroom, washing, cleaning, and enjoying it. I go, this will not do as punishment. And I, again, I was just beginning to learn the temperaments, and I realized, uh-oh, discipline needs to be different for the temperaments. Phlegmatics who hate work, that's good punishment, discipline. Cholerics who love work, Mikey, you go in your room right now and sit on your bed and you don't read, you don't play with anything, you just sit there and do nothing. He hated it. He has high energy. He wants to do things. He wants to fix things and save things and clean things and build things. Nope, you're just going to sit there. And after a while, they both came to me and said, we've had enough, we'll be obedient. And I said, okay, fine. And we had a good time after that. So that's how I learned, don't dispense the same punishment to different temperaments. How does the melancholy parent? Some of you have said this to me today, why I'd be delighted to put my moods last, I mean, my needs last again. Is it good to put your needs last? Good. Yes and no. The melancholy is deeply, deeply caring. 
and nurturing. They spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with their kids. They know intuitively to move in. <clears throat> They're good teachers, especially with the details. They love to explain interesting things to their kids. They expect perfection, and they may give long <laughs> lectures. Do any of you, anybody have a parent who gave you long lectures? No? I see, uh, I see a couple heads nodding, yes. Okay, probably there was some melancholy there. They're overly suspicious. Overly, they're not, okay, let me rephrase that. They're not overly suspicious. They tend to be overly suspicious. They tend to be a martyr, right? Let's look at the phlegmatic. How does a phlegmatic parent? They're easygoing and very caring. They lovingly provide the basics. They may not give you the frills or all the extras that you want, maybe the time, attention, or whatever. They will give you the basics faithfully. They're a patient teacher. Patient. The phlegmatic is so patient by nature. If they have some melancholy in, well, that's another thing. They do get overwhelmed, and they do tend to be late. They do tend to run late. <clears throat> they don't want children to bring up any problems. They can be engaged in struggles with their choleric children, and being overwhelmed, neglect the rest. They can really, because phlegmatics tend to move in, and in all their relationships, they're really good on one-on-one. -on -one. But if they're Working with it, one child, they can neglect the rest because they're really trying to help that one. Does that make sense? Do you see yourself in any of these? And remember, you're two of the four. Okay, let's have some more exercise. <laughs> I want you guys to talk about with your friends. I want you to turn, turn your tables around and have your two tables face each other. One in front, turn around to the other. And talk about your family growing up. Please share with your neighbors somebody in your family that had a very clear and distinct temperament that you've learned about today. What you thought about it, how it affected you. Just anything.